competition is everywhere, but don't necessarily view it as competition because if the black dollar has 1.2 trillion in annual spending power, you don't have competition. No one is your competition because 1.2 trillion can be spread throughout everyone. Buy Black Podcast, Episode 3. How my guests went from soldier to school supply manufacturer in just three months. Welcome to Buy Black, the only podcast dedicated to helping you find, connect with, and support Black-owned businesses. We're on a mission to bring consumers and business owners together to ignite the global Black economy. I'm your host, Gerald Jones, And if you're a black business owner or a socially conscious consumer, you've joined the right community. Ready? Let's get to work. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today for the third episode of Buy Black. I really appreciate you guys going with me so far. And before we get started, I wanted to just go over a few housekeeping things. Uh, The first thing, ratings and reviews. I've had some people tell me that they've tried to go in leave a rating or review, and it hasn't actually stuck. So I'm just going to recommend that if you're going to do a rating or review, don't try to do it from your podcast app or from your phone. Uh, Go to your laptop, go to your desktop, go directly to iTunes. And then if you search Buy Black, you'll find me in iTunes. Go to the show's page, and on the Ratings or Reviews tab, that'll be the place where I know that you'll be able to leave that rating, leave the review, and and it'll stick. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, The second thing, sharing the show. Thanks so much for the shares. Thanks for turning other people on to the show. Every episode, the downloads are going up. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for that and then continue to encourage you that uh, the easiest way for you to share the show is as you're listening, like even right now through your podcast app, there's probably some social media share buttons. Whichever one of those channels it is that you spend the most time that you've got the biggest following or, or network, just go ahead and click that share button. Throw the episode up there for other people to find that will really help me get more eyes on the show. And it's pretty low impact, just a single click. So uh, I'd really appreciate it if you do that. Uh, I'm going to come back after the show to give you a heads up on what's going to be coming down the pike for the next few weeks. But for now, I wanted to give you some background on today's episode. So my guest today, Nika, was actually the first person to respond when I reached out to pitch the concept for this show to a few business owners. Um, We got on the phone, she gave me some really great insights, and we stayed in touch over the month or two that it took me to get this whole thing set up. Also, her interview was the first one that I recorded for this show. And uh, as with most first interviews, there are a few hiccups that you go through and some lessons learned. So um, when we got together to record this interview, we got on the phone and uh, I wanted to do a pre-interview. And so we just started talking about the, the episode and the questions I was going to ask. And her responses were so great that I was like, man, this stuff is awesome. Why don't I just press record now? So I started recording the pre-interview. Well, we stayed on that call for about 45 or 50 minutes, and it was great. And so when it was over, I said, you know what? All we really need to do is go back to the first two to three minutes so I can um, introduce the show properly. But then as soon as you get into it, everything we just recorded, that's the show. It's great. Well, uh, when we went to do that, my subpar software that I was using at the time crashed and lost that entire conversation. So we had to start from scratch. So both of us (laughs) were a little bit disappointed, but we regrouped. Nika, being the pro that she is, just went right back at it. Uh, Everything that we hit in that first conversation, didn't miss a beat, brought it right back, and gave us the really awesome interview that you guys are going to be listening to here in a few moments. Uh, Really got to appreciate that. Now, even though this was the first interview that we recorded, I wanted to put it third in queue, and Nika agreed with me, because her company sells school supplies. Well, it's near the end of July, so everybody's going to be going out right now to buy school supplies. So I highly encourage you guys to go to InnovativeSupplies.net and check out the inventory that Nika has. She's got pieces created by some incredibly talented artists with powerful messaging, with designs that are perfect for students of all age groups, from elementary all the way up through college. So go check it out. And if you use the coupon code BUYBLACK, 
when you go to checkout. You'll get 15% off your order between now and July 31st. And then the second thing that I want you to do is I want you to go to the Kickstarter campaign that she has for Innovative Supplies. The campaign is only going until July 28th. So there's only five more days for them to reach their goal. And they really appreciate your donations to put them over the top. So they're looking to expand their inventories for this season, as well as get some much needed hardware and graphics design software so that they can be even more efficient at getting products to market for you guys. You can find both of the links to both InnovativeSupplies.net and their Kickstarter campaign in the description for this episode below. Well, I think I held you guys up long enough. So let's get to the show. I'm joined today by Nika Brown Massey, the founder and CEO of Innovative Supplies Worldwide Incorporated, a school supply company specializing in displaying positive imagery of black culture, both past and present. Last year, she was featured in publications like Jet, Essence, and Centric TV after she sold over 8,000 supplies in less than 24 hours and had to temporarily shut orders down. Now we're moving into another back to school season and we're excited to have her with us today to talk about her business and share some knowledge with the community. Nika, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I want to go ahead and get the formal stuff out of the way. This is a show that exists to highlight you and your business. So what does Innovative Supplies Worldwide exist to do and what do you bring into the community? Innovative Supplies Worldwide is a school supply manufacturing company based in Columbus, Georgia. Our bread and butter of our business is making and manufacturing spiral-bound notebooks with artwork on the front covers. The reason for our existence was basically I didn't see school supplies that I felt represented the community that I wanted to see represented. After completing nine years in the military, I decided I wanted to go to school, get my degree in history, and be a history teacher at my local high school in my community. So with that comes needing the right tool to start on this new venture. I was going from store to store. I could not find any supplies that I wanted. So I created a few ideas in my mind. In a couple of days, I had those supplies come to life, and I said to myself, these are supplies that I feel like I could sell and market and get to other consumers. I wanted to see these products in students' hands, not just my own. I wanted to share this experience. So what I did with this concept that I just created was I found a website that would host us, and I put the products online. I knew that this was a market. I was anticipating, you know, a few orders coming in, and I could handle it myself. Well, when I saw that it was 8,000 notebooks, I knew that I had to shut down the website, find some employees, and and us get the ball rolling. And that's exactly what Innovative Supplies did. We reached out to some teenagers, brought them on board, hired them at $8 an hour, and we sat down and we got busy on, on making our stationary notebooks that's our bread and butter of the company. Who did you reach out to? I mean, did you go friends and family first and then branch out from there? How did you find uh, the teenagers that help you run your company? So my brother uh, was a junior in high school. Um, getting ready to start his junior year that summer when I reached out to him with the idea. He was very skeptical. He was like, this is not going to work whatsoever. But at the same time, he was like, you know what? You're my sister. I'll support you. I'll be on board with you for this idea. That day when we placed our website online and, and did our advertisements and we started to see the orders roll in, it was like a, a light bulb went off in his head. I instinctively turned him into a entrepreneur protege, if you will, where his light started tinkering in his mind where he was like, okay, we need to go get this. We need to set up this. We need to do this. So he went from a non-believer to immediately a believer once he saw the orders roll in. He gathered a team of his friends, about six or seven teenagers that go to his same high school, and we all put our minds together, and we diligently worked throughout the summer last year to get those notebooks made. 8,000 that first 24 hours and then 20,000 plus from last year alone. How did you find the concepts for the art that you put on the front of your notebooks? I'm a big art fanatic. I I love to look at art. I love to shop for it and and just be around it. And I noticed that in my phone, I screenshot a lot of artwork that I had seen on Instagram. And I said to myself, this artwork is beautiful. I'd love for the world to see it on a larger scale. 
how can I do that? And so I immediately thought to myself, stationary notebooks, you know, that's something that you carry around with you when you go from class to class or from event to event, that that artwork can be a canvas onto that stationary. I reached out to particular artists and partnered with them on using some of their artwork. And then some of the artwork I came up with myself and had some graphic designers put together what I had in my mind and putting it onto an actual template that we could use. Last year, there was one artist, Lola Art Factory. I reached out to her and told her I would like to partner with her and give her 30% royalty to try this new venture that I had in my mind. She was fully on board with the idea. When those first 8,000 started rolling in and she started to see her royalties. She was really happy about that. I believe she made over $2,000 in royalties last year. What I try to do for artists is to give them a platform. And I believe that this is a great platform for the artists because every year we recycle. We, we do something different. We have a new collection. You know, we had 2016 covers. Now we're bringing on a, a whole new line of 2017. The idea is to have fresh, vibrant, new artwork every year that students and parents and teachers alike will be excited to purchase because it reminds them of a time period in their life that they were happy about or just because they're seeing new artwork in general. So are you accepting new concepts now? Yes, we are. We accept them year round. The biggest thing that we do not take is anything over sexualized. One of the pieces that really stuck out to me was a notebook that you have with an image of Tupac and he's wearing a t-shirt that says I am Sandra Bland. Out of all the images that I've seen on your website, that one really spoke to me the most. Where did that piece come from? I found an artist on Instagram, Raheem underscore Milton, and I reached out to him, same as I did with Zola Arts Factory, and I told him what I was trying to do. He offered me the entire piece for $140 outright. It was a deal that I knew I couldn't pass on. It was also great because it gave him exposure. You know, now everyone's asking, oh, who's the artist behind this? So I didn't take it lightly, and I knew the responsibilities that came with showcasing his artwork. People like us, we, we come from this military background, right? You've got this internal love and patriotism for the country, and that never goes away. But at the same time, you know, we are wearing this uniform. Um, we're black in America, and that does come with, with challenges that other people don't face and frustrations. Mm -hmm. And there's a need to be able to express that and bring light to that in a way that also is uplifting and, and educational. And I think that piece in and of itself, it strikes that balance and it's just beautiful. So I, I love the way that you're going about bringing a voice to the black community in a way that honors the people that we've lost, but also it honors our nation as well. Definitely. Thank you. So there's two things we've already talked about, right? You started this company and you immediately went and you started hiring minority teenagers in the community to help them get soft skills that a lot of times teenagers don't get. And then the next thing you do is you go out and you find black artists and you work with them, collaborate with them to create the art for your products. And then on top of all of that, you're depositing in a black owned bank. So, I mean, you're just hitting every single vertical of social activism right now. Talk to me about that. Finding a black owned bank and what does that do for the community when, when you're putting your money into a black owned bank? I love to find information on Instagram. And one of the posts that I saw on Instagram was a post about black owned banks in the United States. And that was a pretty big post for me. When I saw that post, I immediately was like, wow, this, I just never knew. Immediately, I found Citizen Trust Bank in Georgia and saw that there was a branch in Atlanta, which is an hour and a half away from Columbus. But I made the drive to Atlanta and opened up a bank account so that our profits could start to be deposited into a black-owned bank. And I felt it was important to do that because any business that wants to grow needs working capital. And banks offer 
working capital to businesses, I knew that if I put my profits into this bank, my profit could be used to help other businesses down the line that need working capital. I highly exactly. commend you for making that decision up front and doing the legwork to find a business. I love it. You are the epitome of supporting the community in a 100% positive way, and you're doing it through action, not through talk, which I, I find to be absolutely refreshing. And I think that's a great lesson for, for all of us out in the community. A lot of times we think that, you know, the only people who have access to that or the only people who can make a big impact are the people who already start with money. But it doesn't work that way. All it takes is that you just get started wherever you are. You take your idea like Nika and three days later, you've got a company. Four days later, you've sold out of your product. And the next thing you know, you're an internationally exporting company who's getting recognized by the state and growing exponentially. All it takes is that do factor. There's always the thought, but the fact of just reaching up and saying, this is what I'm going to do and taking that first step. And you never know what opportunities end up opening up as soon as you start acting. You have no idea how many people I've encountered that say, oh, I have this idea to do this, but I'm going to do some more digging first. I get so down when I hear that because it's fine to dig and set yourself up for success. But if we're two months in, three months in, and you come back to me and you tell me that you're still doing research, I start to get a little discouraged because like, hey, are you ever going to make that move? You know, don't be afraid of the bumps that will come in the road because they will come. You cannot avoid them, but what you can do is react and adjust and make yourself better through those lessons and through those bumps. Anyone out there that's listening, I would say act, do, and then adjust from the situations that arise. Do not be afraid. Don't let your research take a year and then you never do. Competition is everywhere. But don't necessarily view it as competition because if the black dollar has 1.2 trillion in annual spending power, you don't have competition. No one is your competition because 1.2 trillion can be spread throughout everyone. There's, there's no need to say I have competition. What I say to anyone that's like, I'm afraid of competition, I say to them, don't be afraid because if anything, if they see you coming up, what they'll do is offer to buy you out. So if you get big enough to the point where you have someone offering to buy your company from you so that you can walk away from your company, guess what the, the, you in turn can do? start up another company and let another company view you as competition and you just keep getting bought out. Wow, that's a whole other um, <laughs> dive that we could take about... The, we could, we <laughs> yeah, could. About the, you know, exit strategies and everything like that. Right, because a, a <laughs> lot of companies don't want competition. And so what do they do? They buy their, their competition out. So don't be afraid of the competition. Keep growing, get big enough, and let that competition come to you and say, hey, here's $2 million for you just to completely fall off the marketplace and let us keep doing what we're doing. Take that $2 million, invest it into another startup, and keep growing it so you just keep getting bought out of all your ideas. One thing I want to add before we move on from this, because, oh, we could, we could spend three hours talking about that. <laughs> you, you touched my hot button now. One key for those of you guys out there who do start a business and you want to look at, you know, what is my exit strategy going to be from this business? Do I want somebody to buy it? Which usually that answer is yes. Make sure as you're going along that you are documenting everything you do. You're making a process for everything that you do. And the more that you can make your business function without you there, the more valuable it's going to be to somebody who wants to come and buy it out. Nobody wants to buy a business where the only person who knows how to make everything work is the person who started it. Because now if they lose you, they lose all the value you've created. So build your business, but document everything, automate as much as you can, make everything a process so that you can show there's value here without me being here. Give me the money, Definitely. you take the business, and I'll move on to my next project. I noticed on your website that you have a badge up there that said you're a registered veteran-owned business. Talk to us mm -hmm. a little bit about the process for, for doing that, 
what that gives for you and, and the difference between being registered versus having the actual veteran-owned business designation or certification for, for the government and big companies. BuyVeteran.com is a website that has hundreds of different veteran-owned businesses listed in their directory. Businesses that are looking to do business with veterans can go to that directory and find those businesses that they're interested in doing business with. Also, with being listed on that directory, I get a Vetrepreneur magazine that comes to my house once a month. And this Vetrepreneur magazine is filled with information and resources on veterans who have left the military service and turned into entrepreneurs. The difference between being a registered entrepreneur on buyveteran.com and being a certified veteran-owned business, women-owned business, or minority-owned business is the cost difference. To actually have the certification of being a veteran-owned business, that certification can cost upwards of $500 or more. What we want to do this year is get our certifications on being veteran-owned, minority-owned, and women-owned. What that will allow us to do is to work with government agencies and Fortune 500 companies that are looking for supplier diversity, but they want to see those certifications before they order from us. And I just want to expand on that real quick for the audience. So a lot of people may not realize that there are government contracts out there, huge and small, and there is literally billions and billions of dollars on the table every single day for contracts with the government. There's a website, which we'll put in the show notes. It's www.fbo.gov. That's Fed Biz Ops. And that's where they will list all of their contracts. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a huge portion of those contracts are called set-asides, which means that they are set aside away from the large companies. They are not allowed to bid on them. And they're set aside either for woman-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, or specifically minority-owned businesses. So if you have a a small veteran-owned business set aside or a small woman-owned business set aside, that means that when you go to bid on that contract, you're only going to be competing against other small businesses who meet that criteria makes it a lot easier to win work and it can be huge for your startup or your small company when it comes to getting an initial influx of cash or capital and a lot of times something that can be uh, very stable a stable source of income as opposed to just being in the private market with that i want to get to you nika i want to ask a couple of questions that are a little closer to home What's brought you to this point as a person, as an entrepreneur, as a leader and mentor to your team? What is it? What's that driving force for you? I would say the driving force for me has been no two days along the entrepreneurship path have been the same for me. And I enjoy that about life. I don't like the monotony of everything just staying the same and waking up and doing the same thing over and over and over again. When I was in the military, I did a lot of that. You know, wake up, you know what to expect, you know what to do. Now that I'm out of the military, I told myself I wanted to be put into a challenging position, something that required me to think on my feet every single day and really make things up as I go along, but making them up in a way that it's impactful, it's positive, it's productive, and it's getting things done. Every day is something different. And I, I enjoy that about life because it makes me feel as if I'm truly living. If you would tell a budding entrepreneur, somebody who wants to learn information to go and get started, where would you tell them to go? Any bookstore that sells magazines, go to the business section of the magazine shop and grab three or four five or six. Consider it an investment. Don't look at it as, why do I got to get five or six? Because guess what? No two magazines are going to have the exact same information in it. They're going to be different stories, different topics, different resources, and different tools. Don't limit yourself to just one of something. You have multiple options you can choose from from multiple companies. Pick up a few books on business. Pick up a few magazines on business and let those be your tools and your resources. You and I I think are opposites on that one. You love to read. I love to listen. My absolute best ideas come from listening to podcasts. There are probably three or four business and marketing and online marketing related podcasts that I listen to regularly. What are some of the ones that you listen to? 
The Happy Black Women podcast is a great podcast for minority black women who like to listen to a happy podcast that talks about business and business development, but also who like to hear about the possibilities of going on to retreats with other like-minded individuals who are about business and are about progression and networking and, and mingling. They bring on a host of different women who talk about what they do in the business sphere and how they help other business owners. That sounds like a great resource. My number one is Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, hosted by Jay Jones. And that's actually the podcast that got me started on my entrepreneurial journey six or seven months ago. I'm going to have to get into Instagram now after talking to you. Yeah. Uh, so Instagram it's, is it's huge. like the millennial. Yeah, it's like the millennial thing. Everyone's on Instagram. I see Facebook happening, but it's for the older generation. And that's fine. But how I plan to structure it is. You know, having someone to run the business of Instagram, to run the business of Facebook, and to run the business of Twitter. So you got to find someone that specializes in that market and allow them to work their craft onto that particular platform. What's the most difficult obstacle that you've had to face in starting this business, and how did you overcome it? The most difficult obstacle that I've had to face is trying to keep the business growing and not shutting the doors down. When you start a business, what you want to do is keep investing into it because you're like, wow, this is, this is doing so well. Let me keep putting money back into it. That's not always the smart move because you put all your money into inventory, all your money into marketing, all your money into advertising. You're left with absolutely nothing to reinvest into next year, into the next year, into the next year. So the biggest thing I would say we've had to overcome is finding a way to create a reserve and and have that working capital set aside. And we're still trying to overcome that at this point in time. We're going to be launching a Kickstarter on July the 5th to bring our new inventory that we don't currently have on the site. We want to sell book bags. We want to sell rulers. We want to sell school calendars and planners. So with our Kickstarter, what we're looking to do is raise funds to get that inventory purchased and onto the website, which will allow us to generate some more profits this year. What we'll do with those profits is have them set aside for the next year so that way we can reinvest into new inventory, new ideas each year. Now, I read that a lot of businesses fail within the first five years, and it's mainly because they don't have their accounting up to par. We want our accounting to be up to par where we know what we can afford to do each year. A lot of organizations have reached out and said, hey, would you donate, you know, for this cause and donate for that cause? And of course you want to do it because it helps to get your name out there, but the donations still cost money. You have to pay someone to make the inventory that you want to donate. You have to have the money to buy the materials that you want to donate. So donations are great when, you know, you're up there, but when you're a startup company, do not be so adamant on donating to everyone because you have this good heart. Sometimes you'll have to say no and look at the budget and see if you can put that into the numbers. This year, we also plan on having a great accountant on staff that can let us know if we can do these things right away. Oh, that's great advice. You mentioned that you're going to be starting a Kickstarter here soon. Mm -hmm. Last year, I believe you guys did a GoFundMe. Is that still going alongside the Kickstarter or are you guys turning the corner? Yes, we're, we're turning the corner. I liked GoFundMe last year, but at the same time, I didn't because anyone that supports GoFundMe is supporting the idea and they get a pat on the back for donating and I love that but I don't like the fact that I don't get to give them something in a form of a tangible product that they can hold and feel as a form of a thank you. For Kickstarter what we are allowed to do is to give an item for their contributions and for their donations to help us back our projects and, and back our ideas. For 2017, with your donations, you will get a school calendar or a t-shirt or a book bag with a notebook inside of it. On July 5th, when we launch, we'll talk a lot more about some of the tangible items that they'll be getting in return for investing. I wasn't aware of the difference between GoFundMe and Kickstarter, but Kickstarter is really designed a lot more around your business, starting up mm -hmm. a company as opposed to just getting funds for whatever cause. Right. Let's wrap everything up. 
I want everybody to be able to know where they can find you. Of course, we're going to have you featured at buyblackpodcast.com, but how do we find you directly, especially for those artists who might want to submit a concept? Our website is innovativesupplies.net, and we are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you search for Innovative Supplies, you'll find us. We have the teenagers putting together a YouTube account for us that will be on YouTube in a few days. So if anyone's um, in the Georgia area that's listening, we are in Columbus, Georgia, and we have a booth space that sells our notebooks for us at Bluebell Artist Market. And then for anyone that's wanting to submit artwork, our email address is info, I-N-F-O, at InnovativeSupplies.net. Thanks so much, Nika. Final thing, in order to buy black, we need more women, more men like you in the community creating and building these successful businesses. So with that in mind, I want to close with your number one piece of advice for other entrepreneurs or for consumers in the buy black community. Number one piece of advice to the entrepreneurs in the buy black community is to keep a strong hold of your passion and your ambition going forward with your idea, you will need to surround yourself with like-minded individuals if you want to continue to have the support going forward. You may tell your ideas to a few and they may get shot down, but it's out of fear. So don't let their fear consume you into putting off what it is that you want to do. If you feel passionately about it, if you feel there's a market for it, go forward and excel and achieve and be ambitious with your ideas. For the consumers, I would say my number one piece of advice is to be patient with black businesses. One experience with a black business may not be your very next experience with a black business. So keep that in mind and also know and do a little research. If you see that this is a startup, black-owned company, you need to keep in mind that with startup, there could be some hiccups and some bumps, and you need to be mindful that if those do arise, do not assume that this is going to be your experience every time. Give them the opportunity to fix whatever arises and be better the next year and the next year and the next year. Don't completely wash your hands because by doing that, what you're doing is taking away from them to invest into getting better for you. Thank you so much for taking your time out today to share with us your company, your vision. I completely look forward to seeing the Buy Black community reaching out to Innovative Supplies, supporting you, buying products from you, and sharing that information with other folks in their community. Thanks so much for your time today, Nika, and I will definitely be talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, I promised you guys a great episode, and Nika definitely did not disappoint. My key takeaways from this show were uh, the first thing, you don't have competition. If you've got a great idea, put it out there for the world. Don't worry about whether somebody else has already got a similar product or a similar service out there. Uh, Second, Don't research your ambition to death. There's nothing wrong with going out and finding out the information that you need. But once you've got enough to just get started, you've got to go. Because a lot of the opportunities that you're going to find don't really show themselves until you make the first move. So make the first move. Uh, Again, the website for you to go and order from Innovative Supplies, that is InnovativeSupplies.net. And the coupon code to get your 15% off your order is buy black all one word you can use that from today through july 31st so here's a little information about what's coming in the next few weeks my next four episodes are going to be a series on starting your own business i'm going to cover the critical things that you don't need to get your business started as well as three things that you do second i'm going to discuss the essential elements of a business model and how you can draft your business model on a single sheet of paper. Third, I'm going to talk about the different types of business entities. And here we're talking sole proprietorship versus partnership, LLC versus corporation. So we're going to cover all those different things. We're going to talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of each one of those. Full disclaimer right now, and I'll give you one when we get to that episode. I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. It's just a basic understanding of what these entities are. And finally, we're going to talk about five things that you should know before paying another company like LegalZoom or somebody else on the internet to set up and submit your business paperwork. So I'll be flying solo through all those episodes. It's just going to be me. So the next three weeks is going to be a perfect time for you to connect with me if you want to be featured on the show. 
Again, my email is gjones at buyblackpodcast.com. You can catch me there anytime, day or night, if you have questions or if you have recommendations for my show or businesses that I should reach out to to be featured on the show. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you for being part of the Buy Black Podcast community. If you've enjoyed today's show, find us in iTunes or Stitcher to leave a five-star rating and review. Join us next time for another empowering episode.